Hello. Today is January 29th, 2008. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus. Today we are privileged to have Anthony J. and Ferreira. Welcome. Is it Anthony or Tony? Which it's is Anthony J. It's fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. I have a today. nickname. And your nickname is? Chubby. Chubby. Uh-huh. Well, you're not chubby anymore. Mm. Was it due to your youth? When I was four years old, Bernie Sampson tagged that on me, and it's been with me since. Well, welcome. May I ask you when you were born? July 17th. 1924. And where were you born? I was born in Watertown, Massachusetts. And you currently live in Watertown? Yes, ma'am. Have you lived there all your life? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you are married? Married 58 uh, years, 59 and 911. But we came first. Congratulations. Thank you. That's very nice. And you have children? I have two children. Grandchildren? I have four grandchildren. Where and when did you enter the military? December 7th, 1941. As I presume most people know, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. On that day, the people of the United States came together in force, and the very next day, the eligible people that could join the services all went to work for their country. My age was a little bit low. When I became 18, I left Newton Trade School and high school in my last year which was April the 9th, 1943, I joined the United States Marine Corps. And I stood there for four years. They call that a four-year hitch. You were in, in a, a four-year hitch. So later. So you left high school. As soon as you were eligible to join to the join. service, I joined the United States Marine Corps. And why did you pick the Marine, Marine Corps? My older brother, John, joined the Navy. My next brother, James, joined the Marine Corps. And when he came home, he looked pretty good to me. So I joined. When you joined, did you have family, friends, classmates join at the same time? Every friend that I grew up with joined the service. I have a friend named George Andriotis. He joined the United States Navy, and when I saw him come home on leave, he had a little letter on his sleeve. I says, what does that mean? He says, that's Seabees. And the word he used wasn't C construction battalion. He said, crazy battalion. <laughs> but he didn't use the word battalion. battalion. <laughs> we can fill in the blank yeah. there, I think, yes. And he was a good friend. Good friend. It didn't take long before he was killed in North Africa. How did you take that? Bad, very bad. Yeah. I was in uh, Guam or someplace, I don't know, in the Pacific when my friend Harriet Cousineau wrote me a letter and told me he was the first friend that I lost, except for the person, Philip Dodge, that died on the ship in Pearl Harbor from Watertown. Did you know that gentleman? Yes, I grew up with him. Mm -hmm. So did that sort of set reality for you, or had you? Well, won? all it did was encourage the fighting men to do what they had to do for their country. Sure. When you joined, and you were, what were you, about 18? I was 18, 18. years old. Where did you go for basic training? First thing I had to do was go to Boston, be pre-examined, and from there I got into uh, South Station. They sent me down to Paris Island. And Paris Island is in? Uh, so I think it's South Carolina. South Carolina. 
Had you been out of Massachusetts? Had First you traveled? First time in my life. Do you remember that experience? Were you, was it nervous excitement, nervousness, sadness you were leaving home, or? It was exciting because I was, I thought I was doing something good for my country that has been attacked viciously by the Japanese and uh, being innocent to everything. This was totally new. I got into uh, South Station in Boston, got on a train. My mother had bought me a brand new suit. Got down into a place called Hiamasi. There were a platoon of Marines that were already in uniform. What they said to these recruits coming in in their street clothes, you'll be sorry. I'll never forget that. Well, we weren't sorry. We trained very hard. What was training like? Well, there is nothing like training in the Marine Corps, as far as I'm concerned. It's not brutal, but it's very harsh, very strong, very encouraging. And you had what they called DIs, drill instructors. One was a sergeant, one was a corporal. They were served from the day we saw them to the day we left. They put us through the most vigorous training one could go through, including firing all your weapons, bayonets, street fighting, how to kill and not be killed. That was the basic theme. What do you remember liking or disliking about your experience in basic training? I never disliked anything about it, except it was something we weren't accustomed to, getting up two and three o'clock in the morning, running, listening, drilling, more drilling, continued drilling, shooting your weapons, when training with the bayonets. Oh, it was just good non-stop, training. Non-stop, constant. Non-stop. Did you receive any advanced or specialized training beyond basic training? Yes. And what was that? Once you leave boot camp, they claim you're a Marine. And is boot camp about six weeks or longer? It's, uh, it's, it's eight weeks. Eight weeks, okay. But you're not really a Marine, but they dress you up as a Marine and you go to advanced training. I went to several different places, but I ended up in Camp Pendleton, California. It's an old ranch that would belong to a guy by the name of Tom O'Neill where they, their insignia was a T.O., which they used to brand their brandings with, but it was Camp Pendleton. That was the advanced training for going overseas. We went through that, went to San Diego, got aboard a troop ship, and from there it was one island to another island. In the Pacific? In the Pacific, all Pacific. So you took a ship? I boarded a transport ship. How many were on it? I would say, guessing maybe 3,000 in full pack, which included your rifle or whatever weapon you had to have. H had you ever experienced being on the seas before? First time. How did you react? Loved it. Why? Well, whatever, whenever I could get the chance to go to the stern, which was the back of the ship, I would go there. And then when I was put in charge of guard duty, my position was at the stern of the ship. I enjoyed that immensely. My feet used to get wet, but I didn't care. Looking at the ocean? I was right there in the ocean, mm -hmm. yep. And you didn't get seasick? No, or anything? Never. Did others? Yes, mm -hmm. many others did. They just stayed in their hammocks or bunks. So did you know when you were leaving um, California exactly which island you would be going Never. to? 
You were never told where you were going. All you did was get aboard ship and you would go along with whatever came about. So what was one of your first stops? My first stop <clears throat> was Honolulu. And as I was coming into Honolulu, I saw a ship that to me looked like the Baltimore, USS Baltimore, which is a cruiser. And I went to the uh, radio man on there, or signal man, asked him if that was the Baltimore, and he says it was. I says, could you signal him and see if Brother John, boats have made John and Ferreras on there? And the answer came back was yes. And this was your brother? It was my brother. So we set up our, we landed, set up our tents. It was July 17th, and I was in my bunk. I think I was sleeping, and all of a sudden my bunk got a big twist, and I was tumbled over on the deck. I looked up, and there's Brother John. I says, John, what are you doing here? He says, forget that. He says, see if you can get a pass for a couple of a day or so. Brother Jimmy is in Hilo. And Hilo is an island in? Is another Pacific island mm -hmm. in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So I went to my CEO. I was accepted to get a pass. And him and I got aboard a Navy transport, went to see Brother Jim. He had just come back from fighting on Peleliu. And uh, we landed there. Of course, there was no transportation, and he, his, his camp was way up on top of the mountain. So we had to walk and walk, and finally we got a ride from a horse and wagon, and eventually we got there. Was he there for observation? No. Was it an observation post? or No, that was, uh, that was another Marine Corps post that came back from fighting in one particular, one particular island, and they would stay there and get reorganized. How was he? Because it's my understanding Peleliu was a difficult... It was tough. Yeah. It was tough. He made a few explanations that I couldn't repeat here, how bad it was but it was very difficult. He survived very well. And on this island where he was and the three of us met, uh, he was so well liked and he was only a buck private, but the CO gave him his Jeep and he was like the CO himself. He could do whatever he wanted. He was that type of a fellow. And on this island, there was a big ranch cattle ranch and he took us there and they knew him so well that whatever just they welcomed us with open arms so the person in brother Jim James he was so well liked wherever he went he was magnetic How, so you had a three-day pass we had a three-day pass so the three brothers were together together and I should have brought the picture but I completely forgot that's great I'm sorry so after you saw your brothers and you bid farewell, from Hawaii, where did you go? The next thing, we did a little advanced training there in Hawaii, got aboard the troop ship. My next stop was Kwajalein. I was there for a very short time, and the reason for that was we were headed for another island, which was Guam. Guam was just taken over by the 6th Marine Division. So that's the division that I joined. So the, you joined from the troop ship, you joined... From Kwajalein, the troop ship took us to Guam, Guam, and Guam was secured. So we were in the 69th Battalion coming in, but the place was secured with the exception of a few sniper jobs. And then... We trained there at Guam, and we got ready to go to Japan for the major invasion of Japan. When the time came that we were to board ship for Japan, 
All the troops on the island of Guam got aboard ship full packed and we all headed for Japan. At that time, President Roosevelt had passed away, but a new president came in, which was Vice President Truman. He became the president of the United States. One of the basic things he said about his job was, the buck stops here. The Japanese were giving us a hard time. So the United States Marine Corps and the United States Army, Air Force, and the whole government was ready to invade Japan. We were aboard ship, headed for Japan, and the president decided to bomb, Jap uh, J bomb Japan with an atomic bomb. That happened once, and then twice. And the third time, the Japanese gave up. So the troops that were headed for Japan were split up. Some went to Japan, some went to North China. James and John ended up in Japan. Anthony, myself, ended up in North China, Tsingtao. Beautiful seaport, beautiful place. We took all the Japanese people that had been in China for so many years, since I would guess 1938 when they invaded it. We took them, we put them aboard ship, send them back to Japan. China became a little more peaceful. When they, you arrived, back up a little bit, you, you arrived by troop ship. Troop ship. In Tsingtao. What yes. do you remember about the area? I remember when our ship came in, the sandpans surrounded us. And all the people were asking for gifts. They were so thrilled to see the Americans come in. Could any of them speak English? None. No. They what? understood who we were. We were not Japanese. We were Americans, and they just loved us. They called us Amigua. We left the ship, boarded onto Tsingtao. There, we did what we had to do. And what was that? To take the Japanese army and send them back to Japan. So were they considered at that point prisoners of war? There were so many of them there, they were definitely prisoners of war, but they weren't treated that way. They were treated well. And when you took them, were they, had, had they surrendered or were they the already? The Japanese had surrendered, mm -hmm. both in Japan and in China. Mm -hmm. okay. The Marines got a surrender from J Japan. I don't remember the person that received it, but he was Japanese and he accepted it uh, with the Americans to give us the surrender and then away they went. So you took the Japanese army back on your ship? No, no. no. They went back on their own craft. On their own, okay. Yep. And they went back from to, China to, to Japan. Japan. Were they escorted back by any uh, of them? It was such a short hop, I don't know whether it was or not. That would be up to the United States Navy, and I would assume they were. Mm -hmm. So once you got them on the ship, did you stay in Tsingtao? Yes, I was stationed in Tsingtao for over a year try to calm everything down, reorganize the Chinese in that area because it was a great seaport. But then the Chinese didn't like Chiang Kai-shek and they shipped him right out of China back to Formosa. That's where him and his wife ended up in Formosa, which today they call uh, Taiwan. After he left, this person from North China way up north called Mao Zedong, who was a communist, very powerful. Slowly, he migrated down south through Peking, Tsingtao. When he got into Tsingtao, he put the pressure on the United States government, and the U.S. had to pull all the Marines out and all any other American soldiers. 
And we left China. And from then on, history became what it is today. The Chinese are still communists, but they're regulated communists. They're not bad. Beautiful people. Beautiful what do you people. remember about, for instance, your day-to-day -day operation there and, and the in integration between you and the Chinese people? I had a platoon of what you call amphibious ducks. You see them in Boston today. They call them ducks. Uh, we trained on them up and down the coast of Sing Tao with, along with the tanks. We did that up until a certain time when the pressure from Mao Zedong got a little bit difficult. And the United States government decided to withdraw the troops. We were told to go aboard ship and leave. That's what we did. Today, China is still communism, but a much liberated type. We have good relationship with China. In fact, everything that we have today in this country is made in China. So when you were kind of sent packing uh, with your mm -hmm. battalion, yes, where did you go from Sintao? I ended up going to Shanghai, back to Honolulu, and from there to San Francisco. My hitch was pretty close to being completed. And from San Francisco, I was shipped by train to Boston, where I got discharged and became a civilian. They wanted me to reassign myself to the Marine Corps they would give me a rate, uh, uh, an extra rating. I was a platoon sergeant at the time, and I did not accept it because if I did, I don't think I'd be here today. Because? I would have ended up in Korea. In Korea. Mm -hmm. Did you have friends who went into the Korean War? I had friends who went to Korea and never came back, mm -hmm. yeah. And then I had relatives that went to Korea that were younger than I was and came back, fortunately. War is not very good. Sure. Even today, it's not good. When you look back at your time in China, what was the climate and the whole atmosphere like? I mean, it's, it's fairly built up today. Was it built up then, no. or was it more no. rice paddies and things that we think are... are China was very remote. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. Uh, Sing Tao was a great seaport. They had a lot of imports and exports while I was there, but nothing extravagant. It was just normal. The Chinese people were beautiful. Their the vehicles, their trucks were run by steam. They had uh, fires in, in the uh, rear of the truck to create steam to operate. They were very backwards, but very intelligent people, and good people. What was the climate like? Just like Boston, where Sing Tao is. Mm -hmm. Sing Tao's climate, is, as far as I'm concerned, is the same as Boston. Have you ever been back? No. Would you ever have an inclination to go back? Well, I was going to go back with <clears throat> my friend Louis Gentile, who did this article in the Boston Globe, but we never made it. He passed away two years ago. Yes, I would have liked to have gone back. So when you say they, was it the Marine Corps wanted you to re-up, so to speak? Yes. Okay. Did you, during your time, because it was, as you said, close to four years, or four years. Four years. Did you have any kind of what we call R&R, &R, a time no. to rest? No. Or, yeah. No. But they did have them for a lot of the Marines that were that have been in heavy combat, they had r and in different parts of the country where they would send them, yes. I didn't need it. You did not see combat? No. But you said that... I, um, we had problems in North China, yes. I had a company of Marines that we used to... We had some communist problems, yes. We took care of them. It was combat, but not 
like an invasion, no. But when you say you took care of them? The communists were trying to come into Tsing Tao. We had to prevent them from doing so. That we did, to a point. When it got so heavy that the United States Marine Corps or the United States government decided it was time to leave, we left. Then they took China over. Then they took it over. So you prevented it for a time. Yes. Yep. How did you get progress reports or news? For instance, you were on your way over when the atomic bomb dropped. Yes. Did you hear anything about it prior to it happening? In my recollection, I heard nothing about it except that when Truman dropped the bomb, the Japanese, the J Japanese government had surrendered and we were aboard ship on the ocean heading for Japan. Most Marines and United States troops went to Japan and some went to North China. That's where I went. I ended up in North China. My brothers went to Japan. Yeah. It was just beautiful because we survived had, we, had he not dropped that bomb, he would have lost a million United States servicemen. And your brothers who were in Japan, did, did they talk about their experiences there to, with you? Brother Jimmy was accepted because he made friends wherever he went. Brother John was aboard the USS Baltimore. He went there. They went aboard. They went aboard. They landed, or they went abroad on the land, but they didn't last long. They, they were on board ship. The Navy just kept moving along, mm -hmm. but the Marines stayed. Did you get news from newspapers or any kind of radio contact? No. So when you heard that the bomb was dropped, what was the reaction of most of you on the ship? We were thrilled. We thought we'd be going home. But instead, we went to different directions. We still did what the government wanted us to do. One was to land in Japan, and the other to land in China. Because those two countries were uncertain at the time because of the war was in that area. So you knew even though the so-called war was over, there were still missions to complete. Yes. And as you said, places to clean up or to it reorganize. It took a while before the, uh, the uh, signing of the peace was done. I happened to be there when the Chinese signed, a uh, Japanese signed in China. And in Japan, they did the same thing. Tojo, I don't think, I think was the premier at that time. He signed a peace agreement with the United States. And the lull started. The war was over. How much did you know about the enemy that you would be facing, in this case the communists, um, prior to going over? Nothing. All I knew was the Japanese. So in your marine training, did they talk to you about what, what you might be faced with? All the Marines did was train you to do your job the best you can do, which was to protect yourself and your country to kill and not be killed, if necessary. I didn't have that success or that, uh, I don't know what the word would be. Your position didn't necessitate you having to kill? Yes. I did a little in China, but not, on, not as an invasion. Mm -hmm. Thank God for that. Now, I'm when here. you say you did a little in China, did you have any face-to-face -face combat or? Well, it was sniper attacks mm -hmm. because they were hitting us at night, and we took care of a couple of them. Mm -hmm. They were not bad people. It was their control by the communists that did what they had to do. And they did it. And we had to protect ourselves, and we did. Whatever portion of property or 
parts of China that we had, we had to protect. We had an airfield to protect. We had a lot of the infrastructure in Tsingtao that had to be protected. We had schools to be protected, and that's what we did. And was this a school for the Chinese children? The school was basically for Japanese children. Then it was turned over to Chinese. Okay. Yes. So you were in northern China. Tsingtao, North China. Now why were Japanese children there? Japanese have been in China since 1938. Okay. They invaded China big time. So these were family members of some of the... I would say the, peop the, ch the Japanese who were living there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> were they You heard allowed... of the rape of Nanking? Yes. Yes. Well, that was the beginning of the Chinese, the Japanese invasion of China. China had no protection. They had nothing to protect them from any in country that want to invade them because countries from all over the world, they didn't invade China, they came to live and produce in China, which Chinese accepted them because it brought influence and money to China. The Japanese had a different idea. They invaded China and took China over till the United States Marines and government sent them back home after the war. So when you sent these back home, it was also families, yes? Like the students? There was, there was no uh, basic uh, desire to isolate any of them. They were, if they were Japanese, they were taken out. Okay. And they knew it. Mm -hmm. They organized themselves and they got themselves ready to go and they left. Do you feel that uh, during your time as a Marine, your weapons the ship that you were on quite often were equal to better than or inferior to what you think uh, you would be facing? The United States government was the best protected and trained soldier in the world. Even though the Germans were very heavily trained, none of them could match the United States. And the reason for that is not the soldier, marine, or sailor, there himself, but what was behind us at home. What was being done at home was what made the war a success for this country. And by that, do you mean those who were supporting you by helping to build the ships and build the... manufacturing the of ships, mm -hmm. guns, tanks, weapons, the women mm -hmm. that replaced most men that went in to fight, it all came together such a perfect method that that's what won the war for the U.S. And Our did, production. Did you know women back here in oh, the yes. Watertown area who went to work? Yes. And did things that normally a man would have been doing? My sister was one. She worked for the Raytheon. I had relatives that worked for different manufacturing, the Watertown Arsenal, which was a big company who no longer exist today. Uh, then we had uh, the civilian manufacturing companies that converted into wartime manufacturing. It was, a, it was an all out expression of the whole country. Did your sister stay on with Raytheon after the war? I don't believe she did. She found a person in there, she got married and came home, yes. And you mentioned that you came in through Hawaii, California, and then put on a train to Boston. So were you discharged out of Boston? Yes. And you were a Boston platoon Naval Yard. sergeant. How were you, f how, what were your thoughts? How were you feeling when you were coming home? I was happy. Uh, I had my sea bag with me. What was in your sea bag? My whole life was in my sea bag. I carried it with me for the whole four years. And my locker box, I still have my locker box, which was shipped from China to Watertown. And when you say your whole life was in your sea bag, did you keep a journal? No. Did, did you keep letters? No. So what was in there? My current clothes, 
my uniform, my, under, my underclothes, my boots, and my 45 weapon. That was it. Were you able to keep that or you had to the hand that in? The weapon had to be surrendered in Boston, the naval shipyard, I, which I, I didn't mind. I was through with weapons. I had a Russian gun, a Russian pistol. I took it apart and discarded it in different barrels so no one could ever put it together again. And I never touched another weapon since. When you came home, did you discuss with your family? You had brothers who experienced certainly situations. There were seven inferiors in the service that all came home alive. My mother of five children had three children in the service. She says if my family comes home I, peacefully and healthy, I will take a collection and buy a saint and donate it to the church. She bought a saint. His name was Saint Anthony from all the money she collected from her friends and relatives and presented it to St. Teresa's Church in, in uh, Watertown. Is it still is there? The church has since closed. Mm. So it's these seven in Ferreira, some were cousins? Cousins. And you all made it back alive. Thank you. We were safe. Yeah. Did you discuss it all when you all got together, or did you all just... Constantly. Sort of, you did. We used to argue, because one was a soldier, one was a sailor, and another one was a Marine. And it just conflict kept going on. It's part of living, I guess, in a family. We just had a good time discussing our history. Did some of the stories grow in time, or was it, was it a one-upmanship in your parts that you all tried to outdo each other, or was it just stating fact? We discussed, no, everything was said was facts because we knew nothing different. Uh, we were honest with one another. And uh, we all, our stories were all successful. And it's interesting you say this because perhaps because you were all brothers and you all experienced it, you were able to talk about it. So many of the interviewees mm -hmm. that we've met in the past have said they didn't Did discuss not. it. Mm. Do you feel it helped you all to discuss it and to sort of get it out of your system? There were so many. My mother of five children and her and our family extension was pretty big. Uh, we always discussed it because it was quite an experience. Some were in Europe and the others were in the uh, Pacific. So we had both sides covered. We had experiences galore. So the Inferreras won the war. They did their part. They did their part. Yes, like you did. Like so many other good servicemen in this country. Sure. We have a A beautiful country. Yes, we do. When you came back, did you join any unit of the military reserve or? I joined the uh, Marine Corps League. Talk about and the Marine Corps League. Has that been around for a long time? It's been, I actually joined it in the Marine Corps. Okay. And we have a detachment in Watertown called the Charles Shut Detachment. And my brother was in that also. He passed away. And I still attend some of the meetings, to the uh, birthdays. You know, we have birthdays every November 10th. So we have good meetings at the 10th and dinners. It still exists. Once a Marine, always a Marine. And when you came home, did you take advantage of the GI Bill? Or yes, I did. In what way? I went back to school and graduated from Newton High School. I was quite old at the time compared to the 17, 18 year old children there. But I did my job. I graduated. I wanted to go to college, but I wasn't successful. So I went to work. And where did you go to work? I worked for the hood rubber company known as B.F. Goodrich for 28 years. 
And after 28 years, they decided to close. My pension was $139 a month for 28 years service. That's what I live on today. Do you attend any reunions of your old outfit or have you um, kept in touch with any of your buddies? Yes. I have a Marine Corps friend in Connecticut that wrote this article about the women. He has since passed away. I have another friend in Bangor, Maine. He's doing fine. I have another friend in Marine Corps at uh, Lakeland, Florida. He passed away, but I still commute with their wives. So. But you didn't join any, uh, you haven't gone to any reunions, no. so to speak. And when you mentioned this article, why don't you explain a little bit about what the article is you had shown This you? article <coughs> is about the woman of the United States. There's a lady here holding a baby, and on the other arm, she's got a wrench. You've heard of... Uh, Rosie the Riveter. Rosie the Riveter is one, and the welder. Mm -hmm. These people were women that did so much work for this government to make the war successful that my friend Louie, he was a private in the United States Marine Corps, thought enough about it that he would build or have a statue built or a plaque built such as this one here and dedicated to the women of the United States. And it ended up on the Globe in Boston, and the, this was done in Walnut Park in New Britain, Connecticut. So the women play quite an important part in our life, today, yesterday, and always. How important to you was serving in the military? Well, that's that would be a question that would, could be a selfish uh, answer. I don't think I was ever important at all, like so many millions of others. But together, we were important. And together, we didn't win a war in the Pacific. We won a war in the Pacific and another war in Europe. This country had problems not by their own admission, it's because of invasions of other people. This country stood to the fact that we were gonna take care of things and we took care of the Pacific and we took care of Europe. Beautiful country, strong, smart, intellectual country. And we're still the best. A lot of people would like to hurt us, they're trying, but it won't work. It's impossible, totally impossible. They should understand that this is the country that's made up of all the people that are trying to hurt us because it's their moms and dads that's here that made this country. So they're doing the wishful thinking and doing the wrong thing. Do you feel by joining the Marines that in some way um, it affected your life? It made me a better person, yes. In what way? I have more respect for my country. I have more respect for the people I deal with every day. I learn how to take command and give command if necessary. I learn to understand people. I'm very proud of the Marine Corps. Good. Looking back on all of your um, four years, do you have any kind of memorable experience, character, or humorous event that you'd like to share with us? Just the time that my brother tipped me over in my bunk and then the three of us met in the Pacific. That, that had to th be very special. Yeah. Uh, we all went different ways. We ended up at different places. We never knew whether we would get home again alive or hurt. 
and it was quite an experience, yes. How did I your met, mother react? Oh, I didn't ask mother. you about that. God bless your mother, mm -hmm. who had, at the time, three sons in the three service. Three sons, and she used to pray that not, none of the blue stars would change to gold. If so it, talk about that. Some people watching this may not know about the stars. Your mother would have had a banner in her window. She'd have a banner in the window the size of a uh, 8 by 12 flag. It was red, white, and blue. The center was white with stars, blue stars. If you had one child, one star, etc., etc., and the, the amount of children you had in the service would be the amount of stars you would have on your flag. There is a family here in Natick called the Mitchum family. Mitchum? Mitchum. Bill Mitchum and Donna Mitchum. She had recently three children in the service, so she had a flag on her window with three stars. Two ended up in the Marine Corps, and one was in the Army. That worried her quite a bit. Finally, they all came home. One was hurt. He got shrapnel in his bag, and. Uh, one of the fights that he had in Iraq. But today he's fine. He hurts a bit, but he belongs to the fire department. And another, his other brother that was a Marine was down in South Carolina in a police department. They occasionally get together. We visit them once in a while, the mother and dad, but the children are spread out. What They're was it fine. like to see that flag of hers with the three stars, knowing that Back in the 40s, your mom had the same It's plan. quite an honor mm -hmm. for that family to see all these boys in the service. And the whole street, wherever you went in this country, all had these types of flags in their window about their children because the United States came to the call for their country. It was just beautiful. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us? Any comments you'd like to make? Um, so the people only, watching this. The only comment I'd like to make, I would like to thank both Dan. Dan, yes. And yourself. Thank you. For asking me to be here. I'm very proud to be here. I couldn't give you uh, as much information as I'd like to, possibly. But I, all I could give you is what I know. And you have it all. Well, we would like to thank you, Mr. Anthony J. and Ferreira, for a job well done. Thank I you so much. I appreciate it very much, and thank you so much. God bless you both.